Hope, thank you for joining me today on the Modern Soccer Coach Podcast. Really, really excited to have you on. Thank you for having me. Thank you. First up, like the lockdown, I mean, you had the whole I mean, shutdown of the country. How have you, some people seem to have taken it as a coach education opportunity. Some people have taken it as a well-earned break. What's been your experience of it? Um, I think all above, really. It, it's been... Um, uh, it was a welcomed break. I'm actually back now it, it, in the break in the sense that it didn't mean traveling up and down the country. It didn't mean, you know, weekends. Um, so for me, it, it, it's been a long time since I've had that amount of time in any one place without having to, you know, travel abroad, travel on the road. So in that respect, it, it, it was really nice, quite, quite refreshing. Um, and a, a great opportunity to do other stuff, some learning, some planning. We, we spent quite a lot of time as staff planning, getting things ready for the potential return um, in terms of completing the season. Um, so we had to go through a, quite a process to see whether we would, whether we wouldn't. And if we did, we had to make sure that the players were were ready and engaged so there was a lot of work um quite exhausting actually but but the the upside to that was that it meant i was in one place um the longest period of time i've ever been since i was probably 11 because i've been traveling so much with football so yes but as i said we're, we're back it last week was our first week back this is our second week back um and all the stuff we had to put in place to ensure that that we could go back safely has worked worked out very very well yeah well, what is the priority i mean obviously as coaches you're worried about you mm. know their fitness levels and everything you got there i mean when you get them back there's is there a i suppose a temptation to get cracking right away and how do you kind of go through the process of settling that down and tapering it back up um to be honest we we had a period an off-season period um but then we had um we, we gave them programs individual programs that could gradually build them up to a, le a level to return as um a group so they were doing a lot of programs and a lot of work on their own just so that you know it prevents injury it, it means that their their body you know adapts quite well to when we actually have to go back um and then obviously when we're, we're back it's very structured um, it's had to be, especially with COVID, we've, we've had to be quite strict on time, on groups, and it, we, we just manage it. Um, and they they trust us to manage their loading and their expectations. So it, while they're raring to go, they understand that it's not going to be full 100%. We're, we're not in that place yet. Um, and we've got to build towards that. Mm. Yeah, it's it seems to be like it's a good it's a, there's been a lot of growth in the in the women's game in the league i see mm. this morning i mean you're probably not thrilled to see it but jesse fleming arriving at chelsea and um, yeah it's i mean is the science an area that you've seen growth and i suppose that's where i want to get your insight like where have all these growth happened in recent years do you think? well 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 definitely you know the i think it's grown in all areas really the and, and the expertise and the knowledge that has has come into the game um the coaches are better qualified you know there's there's more um specific education towards coaching the, the youth awards um and all the stuff that the fa over the years have put in place to make coaches um have greater knowledge and how to deal with players how to manage young players how to work loading and then that's supported by the scientists that you know the data that is accumulated that you could you that you use to work on behalf of the players and then you've got the medical provision of, of the physio and the doctor all ensuring that the player is, is the center of everything and they are in the best possible shape they can be in order to perform in a league that is very very demanding so i think the improvement is, is quite a holistic approach um and everybody continues to learn, you know, the game moves rapidly as coaches, as medics, as support staff. We have to move in line with that. When you took the Brighton job in, in 2017, I thought this was a great quote. You said, 
I'm a I'm a builder, so this is great for me. It's what I like to do, and uh, yeah. I was curious to hear what what are the cornerstones of doing that? You know that people talk a lot in in co over here about changing culture, building culture, but what does that process look at a professional club? Um, I think it depends where 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 the starting point is at, at the club, um, and I think for me the the club were in the championship when I took over. I knew that, um, so they weren't fully professional. The players probably didn't appreciate or had no understanding, apart from a couple of what a full time athlete footballer um, looks like, feels like, has to endure on a daily basis. So, so it was great. I, I, you know, I came in. There, there were, there wasn't the support um, structure that's in place now. The club have allowed me to build that. You know, pick the right staff, go through, you know, quite a rigorous interview process, um, and even the staff that were there before had to go through the process of of, of being interviewed. Um, so you go from building your backroom team to, you know putting in place you know even from a technical perspective a football perspective what the ex my expectations were the expectations on the support staff and then you know building a team around you know my philosophy and the way i like to play that that meant over time you know having to release players and having to bring players in um I'm, I'm responsible for the, the the pathway from the RTC to the, the academy to the first team. I was able to appoint the staff I wanted. Again, aligning it to the philosophy at the top has to trickle all the way down. Um, and obviously soliciting the views of, of and getting the input from staff and, and, you know, trying to build something that basically wasn't there. And, and you know, we're not, we're not the finished product by any means. We're still building. I think we're just, you know, those 1% difference in improvements is all part of those building blocks. So, yeah, I mean, it, it was a great environment for me to be able to share my knowledge and expertise and try and put things in place. Mm. Brighton, obviously, is a, is a real community-based club. And, and there's yeah. Been, yeah, it's, it's I mean, I've seen and presentations and read a lot about it. Whenever you're looking at a, at a coach who fits into that there, mm. I would imagine character and personality are, are big big at aspects of that there i mean how do you find that in an interview how do you dig for it personally um quite quite often i mean it's the questions you set number one i think you, you know you never know in all honesty you never know until you know you know that's why you have a probation period which is always quite good but but generally, I you know my gut feeling tells me a lot. I try to stick with that, um, you know, and the responses to questions, you know, that are set, and and you 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 know, you find out a lot. You don't find out everything, um, and as I said, the probation period is there to back you up if 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 you get it completely wrong. But but so far, I've been quite blessed and fortunate enough to work with some really really good dedicated people um that work very very hard in order to to move the club forward and in a position where we where we want to be mm. another aspect that i was i was really curious to get your thoughts of on when i was reading about uh you know outside looking in culture ways i mean something that you get it when when you hear a lot about professional clubs it's about winning and and getting those results on a Saturday. But one of your early quotes again when you took over was how you wanted the team, how the team wanted to learn. So I, I wanted to get your insight on, you know, is that a cornerstone of your philosophy as well, is that there's, you know, the, the players understand that they can still get better and, and still maximise potential at that level? Yeah, undoubtedly. I, I think a lot of our players, um, you know, they came from the grassroots. They went from amateurs to professional you, you know within certainly less than 12 months I was there um and you know want to learn all want to be better want to strive for for you know being the best they can be um and as coaches our, our job is to set them those challenges that, that allow them to grow and, and develop and we're trying to do that at every level um, and certainly I I 
I'm very big into to, to the culture and the environment that we're in. You know, it's about people first, football is second. The, the club are very much like that. So the, the, the values are aligned, which was fantastic. Um, so, and that makes it really, really easy. So when you, you know, when you have a group of players that all want to learn and they want to be the best they can possibly be while helping others and themselves to improve, um, that's a great, great foundation to get everybody motivated to want to be better. Um, so as players, they made my job relatively easy. Easy, You know, I exposed them to perhaps things they weren't used to, um, you know, intensity, you, you know, the demands of the game, you know, pre-season looks like this. It doesn't look like perhaps what you've been used to or exposed to before. And so they, you know, that they want to grow with that and develop and they've wanted to. Um, some have fallen short. We've had to release players. Um, but certainly the, the bedrock of the team, if you're new into the group, you very quickly learn that the environment is one about, you know, people and growing together. And, and for me, that's really important. You mentioned there about intensity and I suppose the growth in the game. And so you have a, a background in sports science, um, mm. and the the World Cup data that was come out about three or four weeks ago that was comparing the 2019 World Cup was was way above the even the 2015 World Cup. I mean, in what areas have you seen the game from a physical standpoint grow and improve? All areas. I mean, the, 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 I mean, I was a player. I was an international player. Um, and it, I think the way players have to train now in order to compete, it, it, it blows what we did out of the water. You know, I, I came from a time when it was, um, not professional. You went to work, then you trained after. And this, this was me being an international athlete. Um, you know, training, you know, at, at most twice in the evening you know you'd, you'd go out and do a bit more um but but today you couldn't get away with that i mean in terms of physicality and and you know aerobic endurance anaerobic speed they're all important factors in the game and um, the game is so much quicker now um than it was in my day than it was 10 years ago than it was five years ago so there's been a real push while on all sides there's been a, a real push on, on the physical capabilities of players to be able to sustain a level of performance you know in body and mind that has really had to be developed over the, over the years you know strength power you know the psychology is, is, has come into the game you know working the mind um as well as the tactical and technical so it's a real holistic approach and one while, while it's a game about the game on the sunday or the saturday and that's kind of the end product of it of it all the the stuff that goes on before that the physical aspect the 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 mind aspect um you know the medical aspect you know the recovery um comes before the game on the saturday or in our world the game on the sunday um and the coaching aspect it it all has to come together and be aligned in order for, for performances to, to happen at the weekend. I'm not sure I answered your question, but you I did indeed. Yeah. I, I, I grew up uh I grew up in that you know, watching football and that like correct me if I'm wrong, this was Sunday morning, channel four, you might get the Doncaster Bells against um you know, an arsenal or sort like the the visibility of the game has obviously changed. Um, whenever you're, I suppose, in that growth, and and it's coming at us. Like I, I was talking to the stats bomb Ted Ted Knudsen a couple of weeks ago, and and it was, is the is the game moving sort of too fast sometimes for coach education? Whenever you're you're trying to get the players, I mean, you're talking about the mental side, the tactical side, the nutrition side. How do you then? You know, or do you manage how much information is thrown at the players? Do you try and see, like, uh, yeah? I mean, I'm I'm a, I'm a, the fortunate end, I guess, where I have you know the psychologists, the 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 scientists, the and they're all full time people. 
So it's a lot easier for me. I, I don't do all of that stuff. We all do that together. Um, is it growing too fast? No, I, I think I think that the danger, the, my only concern, um, I wonder, is, is, is the top end of the game moving away from the grassroots end of the game? And are we, you know, the grassroots game for me is very, very important. It's the next generation of players coming through. And we really have to take care of that as much as we take care of the top end. Um, so that's why for me, when I took the Brighton job, I thought it was really important to be responsible, not necessarily do the work, but, but responsible for the pathway of our players from under 10 to seniors. So that whatever we're doing at the top, it must filter down all the way through and actually start working with the under 10s to ensure by the time they're the seniors, you know, they understand, um, you know, the psychology, how they need to prepare themselves. They understand diet and nutrition without us having to go, you need to do A, B, C and D. So they're already um, skilled at it, understand it, can use the necessary necessary tools in perhaps psychology, do know about recovery, absolutely understand what they should and shouldn't be eating so that then for, for the coach, it just makes it easier just to focus on the tactics and strategies because that will have to change depending on who you're playing against, obviously. Um, so for me, that's why I thought it was really important that the pathway was very clear so that what we do at the top, it does go all the way through. And hopefully, you know, I'm very much into homegrown talent. I'm very much into, you know, the young players coming through um, and we want them to have that 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 education, you know, that we do at the top, at the bottom. So by the time they're seniors, they're ready. They know it all and they can just perform. Mm. Easier said than done. But mm. <laughs> you understand what I mean. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the the recent work with the Football Leadership Diversity Code with the FA? Yes. Well, I mean, this is uh, something um, Paul Elliott um ex-footballer he is the chair of the diversity and inclusion board at the fa um so it, it's really about um a voluntary code uh, putting a code in place that that gives more opportunity or greater opportunity or dare i say some opportunity more than some to to um black and asian players um who want to work in the industry on the pitch, in middle management, within clubs, but you know, a seat at the the table in boardrooms, so that we can be, you know, we. I say we because obviously I'm black. Part of the decision making process, um, opportunities to coach. I think the 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 fact is that I think there's thirty percent. This is in the men's game. Thirty percent representation on the pitch that doesn't extend into management or doesn't you know, as in coaching management, doesn't extend into boardrooms, doesn't extend into middle management, decision makers. And, and you know, it doesn't reflect the game, you know. So, you know, there's a cry out and quite a strong call for change. And this this code is, is the beginning of that process, hopefully. Mm. Well, obviously, we're, you know, it's been pretty predominant in our media as well over here about the change. Mm. Um, something that, and again, I'm, I'm curious of is sometimes I think we can almost put the responsibility to the the big clubs or the leadership and mm -hmm. councils and but we want to be able to move change uh, close to our own doorstep as well. Where do you think small clubs, youth clubs, can improve with diversity and inclusion? I think it's about educate education. It's about education educating staff it's about educating the decision makers because i think there is you know sometimes it's unconscious bias mm -hmm. you know and unless it's presented and you know do you realize that this is happening or do you see this you know sometimes people are not even aware of it um so i really think it starts with it, it, it certainly the grassroots clubs it's all about education understanding that um, the game is for all and, you know, have a look in your own boardroom. What does that makeup look like? You know, and that there's been, you know, I'm quoting anything, though, but people don't know that 
you know, a diverse boardroom, a diverse senior management team, the productivity is far greater. The research has been done. So why wouldn't you look at it? Why wouldn't you educate people and get people to understand that this is really good for business, really good for business? It's good for business. It, why shouldn't it be good for football? Um, so for me, education, I think at the top end, you know, clubs, the FA, the governing body, the football league, the Premier League, all have a responsibility. Um, and I think if, if you get the, the top clubs embracing this, then others will, will generally follow. So that, that's why the starting point has been there. I believe there's going to be a voluntary code for the grassroots game as well, which, which is brilliant. Um, and hopefully we, we can shift, shift things to, to have more equality and diversity in the game. With that education piece, is that... You know, for example, I mean, would you be looking at workshops? Do you think, you know, the, implementing things in the fall? You know, we're all saying, well, our actions are going to speak whether we do this or not. What, what would be examples of that, do you think? Yeah. You know, this is early stages. I don't, I don't profess to, to go, look, it should be this or it shouldn't be that. But as a starting point, yes, it has to be about, you, you know, education within the environment that you work in. Do you realise that? I don't know only 1% of your your leadership team is a person of colour or, you know, or 0% in most cases. Because I think sometimes people just don't, you know, quite often people employ people that very much look like themselves, look and behave like themselves without necessarily realising. So there's either unconscious or conscious bias going on. So what, what that education looks like, um, I think that's all to be discussed. It should be discussed. But then, you know, it, it, it most certainly needs to be actioned. Okay, last couple for you here, because I know you've got another one waiting. Um, the Something else as well, we're talking to the coaching community today about uh, c connecting with players and the mm -hmm. importance of connecting with players. How do you do that with, with professional and senior players? Um, Sorry, I've just got another call coming through. No how, ask the question: How do how do our players connect with what the fan base? Or well, how how do you connect with them? You know, how do you grow those relationships? Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, I'm in, I'm with them every day. I have no no choice but to connect with them. Um, and it, it's very different to an international environment where you see players. You know, maybe a week, and then they go home for go to their clubs for a month, or you're with them in a tournament for six weeks, and then you know you don't see them for two or three months. Um, you, you, the the beauty of club football is that you you, you get that privilege of, of being with them every day. You get to it, it's the quiet chat in the corner. It's it's you know while players are putting their boots on, or you know it, it's talking about the game. It's talking about. I try to get to know players outside of football, you know, as in, you know, what else do they do? You know, some, quite a few of our girls are in education. They've got different hobbies, you know, and I try to get the, to know them on the human side. Um, so, yeah, I, I try to get to know them as, as people as much as I can and as football as second. I think it's really important to try and, you know, the human side of it. I'm not saying I always do it well I'm, I'm you know i'm not saying they all want to open up to me but i you know i try to do that and and doing that it you know we try to support them so if i don't know i i, I really try and encourage our girls to you know it's not just football do something else you know education have a you know we, we offer um level two the you know level three coaching you know we we want them to do other things certainly i do and I try and get to know what their interests are so that I can, you know, maybe try and push them into that channel. Um, so really just trying to get to know them as people first. By those yeah. subtle conversations in the corner over a cup of tea, um, wherever you can, without the formal, as well as the formal one-to-ones that are very football orientated. Um, but I think they're, they're two separate things there for me. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Okay, last one for you. One of the coaches of, of uh, Max has, has jumped on there, he's put a question, which I think is a really good one. And 
how do you get with so much growth that coaches are trying to again that information coming at coaches today and trying to get better how do you get the balance between staying true to who you are and then also having the flexibility to change and, and evolve uh I, I i think you know through through all the learning and all the ways we can learn the books the education you, I think you take what has meaning to you. That that's what I do. You can't. And I always try and just be myself. You, you know, I don't. I don't try. I don't compromise me. You know, I see a lot of young coaches, um, which is great. You learn from other coaches and and learning. You've got to observe from other coaches. But whatever you learn and you take, if it resonates with you then be yourself in that delivery, if that makes sense. Um, I think that's really important. Otherwise, players just see through you. Players are not stupid, you know. So I, I try not to – comp. well, I don't ever compromise who I am. And I take what I think suits me, and I run with that. Brilliant. Brilliant. Great message. Hope top class. Thank you so much. This has been uh, fantastic. Um, Thank you. Sorry, it's short, but no, no, happy to get you on. Like, really, really, really was uh, really excited about this. So, um, wish you all the best with everything getting started back up, and look forward to to following Brighton in the new season. Yes, please do. We need all the support we can get. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Take Bye. care.